So, we're going to go through these uh, notes tonight. We, we started this. These are my notes. This is when I study the Word of God. Uh, this is how, and it's not important to you, but I'll tell you anyway, this is how I always make my notes. This is how I have, you know, people ask for my notes, but basically all they get is scripture because that's 90% of my notes. I have comments that I might throw in like you see very few here, and the rest of it, just the Holy Spirit has to bring it forth as the message comes. And so, uh, but I'll, I give my notes freely away. Uh, you should have them. You should get them all if you can. And if you want to make a notebook, you'll always have something to teach from when you go somewhere. Uh, if so, you have to do something quick, just grab the notebook and head out. And uh, there you'll have it. I'm also doing a, a, a verse by verse in the book of Proverbs every single day on my Pastor Curtis Facebook page. And I believe uh, probably within the week we will already be in chapter 18. That just That's just mind-boggling that we're that far. One verse a day. In about a year from now we'll be through with the entire book of Proverbs. One verse a day how that verse relates to Calvary. Some way, form, or fashion, every scripture, ever precept, ever line. How many of you know Jesus is the man with the line in his hand? Line upon line, precept upon precept. It's all about Jesus and what he did for us at Calvary. If, if it's not pointing directly to that, it, it's, it's talking about what it provides. It's talking about what it does. The whole Bible's full of nothing but that. And so we can relate every verse in the Bible to Jesus and what he did at Calvary. And I'm thankful for that. And that's going to be a great commentary when we're done. One verse a day, praise God. Uh, I hope you're having your own Bible study each and every day. I hope that you get in the Word every day, at least for a few minutes. However uh, you do it, it's your own business. But I would encourage you to turn the light on. Uh, I told Robin the night before last, the Lord just, uh, you know, and you don't ever hear me saying things like this, uh, but the Lord, uh, in, the other night when I was just tossing and turning in the bed, just began to speak to me. And the way he speaks to me most of the time is he just gives me scriptures, and then he expects me to go look them up because he's got something he wants to say to me through the word. And he, and he does. And it's not that way every time, but I promise you, if you'll get in the Word, the Lord will begin to minister to you. It'll be more than just a Bible reading session for those of you who know the message of the cross, which is all of us. When you get in this Word, I'm telling you, the more you get in it, the more you want it. It's, it's, it's totally opposite from eating in the natural. The more you eat in the natural, I'm stuffed, I don't want another bite. In the spiritual realm, the more you eat, the more you want to eat. And that's the way the Lord has it set up. So uh, we'll run through these notes again uh, uh, and try to make it through it tonight. I believe we can. But I put some stuff here. The first, these statements were not in my notes for Sunday morning, uh, but I, we'll read them together tonight. We need to know how to uh, and already be experiencing the power of God's deliverance, which is a part of his great salvation for us. Every one of us in this room, every one of us watching by Internet, every Christian on the planet needs deliverance needs restoration daily. It may not be from Jack Daniels and marijuana or pornography or all these, but we all are, are, are pushing against, by faith, something every day. It may be a tongue that likes to slip out and slash somebody. It may be a mind that likes to wander off and sit in as judge and... and Anybody know what I'm trying to talk about? It, it could be, but there's always something they're pushing. There's always something they're resisting. Uh, and, and, and for us to be being conformed into the image of Christ, it's going to take, as I've said recently, much tribulation do we enter into the kingdom through. You ain't entering if you ain't, if you ain't coming up against tribulation. Amen. Amen. And it's, it's with violence that we seize what we've been offered freely. And e but even though it's been offered freely, to take it freely is not a, a tiptoe through the tulips. It's a fight. It's a fight of faith. It's a good fight. But it's a fight. And, and you and I, you know, if you're not learning to walk with the Lord and learning how the good soldier uh, walks and lives and combats evil, then when that just hits you, you're not, it's too late to learn. Now, 
It's too late at that point. It, you're in it. It's on you. It's whacking you good. And, and most people, not most, but all who don't know the way of the cross, they don't know what to do. Christians I'm speaking of. So, you know, we, we need to take advantage of what we have. When it, when it, and I'm talking about coming to church, being equipped for the work of the ministry. I'm talking about when, and I've been harping on this a lot, even when I went to Oklahoma. I tell folk, don't you come in this house and leave with nothing. If you do, it's on you. God's got some stuff for you, and it's stuff that's valuable, that you need, that you really, really, really need, and that you're going to have to have out there. That's the way the local church should be working. It should be more than a dinner and an ice cream supper and a pat on the back and showing each other our new shoes and talking about our kids and grandkids. When we come to church, we come to praise God and worship God, and when we leave, we have something, and it's more than a feeling. We've got something tangible in our hearts because we are being equipped for the work of the ministry and if folks are not coming to church to be equipped for the work of the ministry then they're coming with a covetous spirit just what I can gain and whatever I can get without having to really give anything because those who are being equipped are those who are preparing to give what they're being equipped with amen brother Curtis Ben Carson said, I saw it recently on social media, when the jihadists get here, they're not going to ask us if we're Republican or Democrat before they cut our heads off. They don't care about your politics, my friends. They don't care about your politics. We better get focused on the faith. Pray for your nation. Praise God for America. Pray for your leaders. There's a whole lot of evil attacking this nation right now, more than ever before. Pray for them, vote when it comes time to vote, and then the rest of your time, don't spend it in that mess. Spend it in the Word, spend it in the Spirit, spend it being equipped for, to work in the things of the Lord. You say this is too radical. You don't have a clue as to where we are now and, and how quickly we're moving greater and greater into darkness. Just imagine 50 years ago, there's things that uh, are on television now. If people could come out of the, come back from heaven uh, that died 50 years ago, they'd probably die immediately again with a heart attack looking at what they see on the streets, out in public. And it's really just a, a scream of the enemy. It's an outrage. It's, a, it's, it, it's the last. We're living in the last few vapors of this age. I'm telling you tonight. The last few vapors and the devil's pouring all out. I mean, passing laws up in New York where they can kill babies up to their birth. I'm talking about abortion up to the birth now. Passing laws. The devil, the devil is, is, is scratching and stabbing and throwing as many darts at one time as he can. And, you know, it's, it's like when I see parades of homosexuals and lesbians out on the street and, and, and they, they, they say they're not ashamed anymore. No, they're more ashamed now than ever before. That's how they're trying to combat it though. That's how they're combating against their fears and their shame is by coming out and trying to show it off. No, they're ashamed more now than ever before. It's, it's, it's deceiving for most Christians to think, well, they're not ashamed anymore. No, that's the fruit of their shame. They're trying to combat it. They don't know all they got to do is come to Jesus. They can be forgiven and delivered. The Lord delivers. The Lord delivers. I believe in the days ahead, and I mean very few days ahead, we're going to see believers casting devils out because there's lots of devils. It ain't just what we call it, just uh, blood disorders and just uh, mental uh, imbalances. Okay, that may be what it is the doctor says, but I'm telling you what, there's devils need to go. Spirits of infirmity are evil. They need to go. In the days ahead, you're going to see believers casting devils out. I said believers, not church attenders, believers, hallelujah. When devils start getting cast out, folk going to quit going to church, most of them, because most of them ain't going for the right reason anyway. The darkness will touch us, but it doesn't have to destroy us. 
We've talked about this scripture, Psalms 107, 19 and 20, Sunday morning. The Lord sent his word, and his name is Jesus. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saves them out of their distresses. How many of you know you can look through the Old Testament and see sinful Israel constantly, over and over, habitually, living in sin, but God being merciful, when they, cry, when they cry out, he saves them from their distresses. So what I'm trying to say at this point tonight is no matter what you've messed up, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter how many years, that whatever that is has been there. If you'll cry out to God, that has got to go. I'm not one of them preachers that's going to send you to some professional talker because he needs help too. He needs help because he thinks he's helping you. And they can't neither one of you help each other. Only people that can help somebody on the planet are those who know the truth. And his name is Jesus. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he saves them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them. From their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Now, I'm going to circle tonight. Y'all don't mind if I have my own little Bible study up here, do you? I'm going to circle the word thanksgiving and rejoicing. Because we're going to see tonight that a part of your victory, a part of you knowing the truth, not just rejoicing and being joyful acting, but listen, true thanksgiving and true rejoicing comes from knowing the truth. A lot of people are out there trying to put on a show to heaven. Oh, God, thank you, Lord, and oh, thank you, Jesus. All this, guy, all this stuff. But if they're out of the faith, all that means nothing. If, and they are out of the faith if their faith is not in the sacrifice. Amen. Let me tell you something else that's coming soon. The book of Galatians, for those who know the truth, are going to be, it's going to begin to be ministered in such a powerful way. I'm telling you tonight, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the book of Galatians, God the Holy Ghost is going to bring the church back to the book of Galatians, and he's going to reveal some things that are going to shock the church. It's going to shock the church when the church wakes up and has to come to a reality that God has not been in what I've been calling God. I'm telling you, the Bible there says Christ cannot affect you. He can't profit you if you fall from grace. And you fall from grace if your faith is not in the cross. And when the preacher comes along and says, yeah, but God can still do a little, you better run from him. I don't care who he is because the book of Galatians refutes that statement. And we are Bible people, not men people. Amen. Psalms 32, 7. We talked about this Sunday morning also. Psalms 32, 7. Thou art my hiding place. That's the cross. That's where we're hidden. Remember uh, the hidden? No, they don't because they weren't here Monday night. We talked about the hidden wisdom in a mystery is the message of the cross. Everything that was hidden uh, in the old covenant has been revealed in Christ through the sacrifice alone. Alone. The, the cross of Christ, his death is what I'm speaking of. All the Old Testament pointed to that. And it was... It was wisdom hidden in a mystery. And when you accept it by faith, you're hiding in Christ. You're, you're in Christ hidden in God. The world don't know what's wrong with you. They just can't explain it. They just call you religious, a, a, a church freak, a, a Jesus freak. They, they got all these names for us because they just can't figure out what's wrong with us. The reality, there ain't nothing wrong with us. It's them. That's right. I mean, we're headed to heaven. We're not perfect, but we have a perfect faith. I was so pleased today listening to Pastor Dan Barrett, uh, minister at chapel in Baton Rouge this morning. I watched that every Wednesday and Friday morning at 1045 uh, till 12 or try to. And he was saying something that the first time I heard it was probably when you heard Pastor Patrick Hatter say it in this pulpit at determined camp meeting. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Pastor Patrick said, your faith is perfect. And it got as quiet as it did just now. All those people in camp meeting just went, my faith ain't perfect. No, 
If you have faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary, that faith is perfect. It's the object you have your belief in that makes your faith what it is. Not if it's weak or strong. No, if it's in Christ and what he did at Calvary, it is a, a faith that cannot lose, that overcomes every obstacle. Paul said, the life I live down in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me. You can't tell me tonight that his faith wasn't perfect. And that's, I got a portion, I have a measure of that faith. And it can't lose. It works by love. And God is love and love can't fail because God can't fail. Woo! Preacher's wife getting fired up up here. Amen, Brother Curtis. Think about that. The Lord is our hiding place. At the cross, through faith in the cross, we, you shall preserve me from trouble. That means you're ever, not ever going to have any trouble? No, it means when trouble comes, you're going to be preserved. <laughs> you shall compass me about with songs of deliverance. Here you go. Here goes our pencils again. Songs of deliverance. Do you see that? Deliverance comes with praise and worship. I didn't intend on this. The Lord just telling us. Deliverance, that, you know what that really means? The salvation of God comes with praise and worship. If it's real salvation being experienced, it comes with praise and worship. I will joy. What's the scripture say? Psalm 35, 9. My soul will be joyful in the Lord. It will rejoice in his salvation. It ain't going to rejoice in what's happening over there or over there, but it will rejoice in God's salvation. Think about that. Turn the page. Are we together tonight? Are we all right? Everybody doing good online? Hadn't run anybody off yet. Well, if you, let me tell you something. If you want to learn the Word of God, you tune in here every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, every Wednesday night at 6.40 p.m., every Monday and Thursday at 8.30 a.m. on my Pastor Curtis page and every Friday morning at 9 on my Pastor Curtis page, not because it's me, but because the Word of the Lord as it pertains to Jesus, the living Word of the Lord, is preached and taught here. And you can be blessed if you just will go along with us. Proverbs 19.23, I think we mentioned this Sunday morning as well, abiding satisfied. The fear of the Lord tends to life. Everybody say, the fear of the Lord. Now, just raise your hand tonight. If you could, stand up and, and, and repeat what that means, the fear of the Lord. I've been teaching it for years now here. We got four or five. I'm talking about what we teach here at Crossway Church. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a hate for evil. The fear of the Lord. But the fear of the Lord is your proper biblical estimated value of God's worth. That's what the fear of the Lord is. If, it, if, if the fear of the Lord tends to life, and Jesus is our life. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And all the treasures of God's wisdom are in Christ then that means only as we look at Christ and not as a Jew, a brown-headed man with some brown eye. No, as we look at Christ. There are two scriptures in the New Testament that talk about looking unto Jesus or beholding him. In, in Hebrews and the book of Romans, both of them uh, talk about looking unto, one of them, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy of the world, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. What's the other one? But we see Jesus, both of them in Hebrews, aren't they? But we see Jesus a little, a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. If you're going to look at Jesus, you're going to look at the cross or you're going to miss Jesus. And I don't mean a wooden bloody beam. I'm talking about when you look at Jesus, you see, my Lord, that's he saved me by that grace that he died by right there. Amen. That Jesus died by grace, tasted death by grace, Hebrews 2, 9, and he did it by faith. By, by grace through faith. That's, he's our representative man. 
You understand that? Every day of Jesus' life, he was headed to the cross. So when people talk about, uh, well, he's already gone to the cross, he's been buried, he's been raised, so we're not headed to the cross. No, listen, when he lived on this earth, he was our representative man. And every day on this earth, he was headed to the cross. Every day you're on this earth, you are going to the cross or you're not going to Jesus. You're not going to the throne. And I don't mean getting an airline ticket and going outside the gates of Jerusalem. Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. His way is the way of the cross. And while we're on this earth, we are going in the way of the cross. Amen. Well, he's not on the cross. That's right. He's at the right hand of the Father. But guess what? So are we. But we're also here. And while we're here, we're going the way of the cross. Because when, when he was here, he went the way of the cross. See how simple that is. Very simple. Now, did I forget anything? Okay. All right. I felt like I was headed somewhere and just y'all made me turn the wrong direction. <laughs> uh, here we are in... Proverbs 19, 23, the fear of the Lord. If you've never done a study on the fear of the Lord, please go do it. You'll be amazed at what you find. You'll find all the blessings are found to those who fear the Lord. And that means, again, giving the Lord the proper value of his worth, which can only be done as you look at Calvary. You don't know the grace of God without looking at Jesus and what he did for you. You don't know the mercy of God. If, it, if, if you hear the word mercy and grace and, and, and loving kindness and all those things, and it doesn't make you think of Christ and what he did at the cross, then you're probably not even saved. Not, because, because to think any other thing about God's mercy and grace and loving kindness, listen, where does it come from? It's not just floating around how I feel today. No, it comes only by one way, by grace through faith. Amen. I, I can't see the word grace without thinking this. God's doing something. God's doing something. So when Galatians says you fall from grace, that means you fall from where God works. How many of you know grace is only found in the truth? Colossians 1, 5, and 6. So grace is in the truth. Grace is only in the truth. And it has to be because grace is God at work and God only works in truth. Psalms 33, 40. See how kindergarten this is. If the church would just accept God's kindergarten, his, his, his simple way that gives us a simple faith, They'd be so much better off. But we like to be big men. We like to look big. And we like to sound smart. And we like all this stuff. Let me tell you something. Just cling to Calvary and you'll be who you need to be. Do what you need to do. Don't worry about other folks. The fear of the Lord is what tends to life. It's right there in your Bible. So I'd say I need to do a Bible study on that. If the fear of the Lord tends to life, then I need to know what it is. And he that has it shall abide satisfied. Now, man, if, if God's promising me in his word that the fear of the Lord tends to life and whoever's got it is going to be abiding satisfied, then I need to know what it is because I don't want to abide. That means continue or remain in a place where I'm not satisfied. Too many Christians walk around with their head down, lip dragging on the ground, they're stepping on it every other step. They need to get satisfied. But you can't get satisfied until you find the fear of the Lord, the value of God, the worth of Almighty God that became a man, saved us from our sins, baptized us with the Holy Ghost, gave us a bright and glorious future in Christ. He shall not be visited with evil. Now, I, look, I always look the definitions of words up. They increase the, or they make they, they give you a, a more rounded picture, if you will, of what the scriptures really mean. They don't change the scriptures by looking up words. Every time, just about every time I look up a word, it's Hebrew or Greek, the, one, one of the first definitions is the word that it is. Like when you look up abide, it'll say, what does it mean? Abide. Okay, okay I already know that. Pass that. Okay, but what does abide mean? It means to continue to remain. Jesus taught that in John 15. If you abide in me, that means remain, continue in me, because you don't have to. 
then you'll be able to bear fruit and my Father will be glorified. But look at this. The word visited means governed by, ruled by, or emptied by. That means evil won't be able to govern you, won't be able to rule you, won't be able to come along and just empty you and destroy you. That's good news. That's good news. It doesn't mean that what we think it means. That, that, you know, it doesn't mean that you'll, you'll never see evil and evil will never knock on your door. Even, no, that's not what it means. See, we need to study the Word of God. If we, because we read scriptures like that, and I, I, it makes us doubt God. You know, it's kind of like Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If you don't really know what that means, you'll think, you know, have you ever been frustrated with your wife or your husband? You're too scared to answer that. I get it. It's frustrated. It's not what we mean. I'm frustrated. I'm agitated. I'm, I'm, you know, no, that's not what he, that's not what the word frustrate means in Galatians 2 and 21. It means to deny or set aside. Just like the word visit here doesn't mean that, like we think, I'm coming to your house after church to visit you. That's not what this means. You look it up when you get home, you'll see I'm telling you the truth. I always encourage you to look these words up for yourself. I, I pray God always let me pastor a group of people who are Bereans who will not just believe every little thing I say, go home shouting hallelujah, and then get caught off guard because I missed it. You need to study for yourself. Go look it up. You'll see. I do the work, you get to add to it for your own self. And maybe you'll get more out of it and come back and say, hey, preacher, i got to tell you something. Because I like that when people do that. And I like it when they ask me questions. So, Because if I don't know immediately, it makes me go dig. And I love to dig in the Word of God because it's a treasure chest. Amen. You know what the Word of God is? It's, it's our life. It's life to us if we know it in context. So let's read this again since we have a little bit better uh, uh, understanding of abide and visited. The fear of the Lord tends to lie, and he that has it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. Now that's all based on, that. listen, that one scripture is all based on if you've got the fear of the Lord. If your value of God is proper, which it can only be if it comes from the word of God, because in the word of God he gives us the revelation of who he is. I told you Sunday, Andrew sat at the table with uh, some people who uh, all of a sudden have uh, gone crazy, uh, been seduced by evil spirits, and, and uh, caught the, it ain't no more a heavenly father now, it's a, a, a heavenly mother, mother God. And they wanted, and they grabbed Andrew and took him because they wanted him, 18-year-old boy, uh, heart full of the word and heart full of the spirit. And they took him, and, and, uh, and uh, Andrew, you know, just after it was over, he texted me and sent me some messages and said it just broke my heart that people, you show them the Bible and they just won't believe it. You know, how many, how many of you have ever been lied to by the devil that said something like, well, what makes you think that's right? We've all been lied to by the devil. But it, 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 what we have to do is say, well, you know what? In the beginning was God. In the beginning was God. And was the Word. What was in the beginning? The Word. The Word of God started everything. So anything that comes after that, any other writings that's contrary against this book, they're all lies. This was first. That wasn't. So that can't be right. The Word of God is God. Amen. So think about this. Man, we could stay on this one verse the rest of the night. The fear of the Lord tends to life. And he that has it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. So just because you know what you know, the fear of the Lord has got to have something to do with Calvary. Because no life comes from God except through Christ and what he did at the cross. None. Okay, the next little square. Fear, fear of the Lord is among those. The fear of the Lord is among those being taught and they see his covenant. Now I love these scriptures we're reading tonight. Psalms 25 verses 12 through 14. What man is he that fears the Lord? Okay, now here we're going to start sorting them out, boys. 
We're not an elitist group of people. We're not heady and think we're better than folks. But God will tell you who they are. God will tell you who they are. If God's wrath in Romans 1.18 is being revealed from heaven against certain things and it's only against those who are deceived, well, who can recognize it? The people who are not deceived. Amen. Doesn't the New Testament teach those that are spiritual to help those that are caught up in some matter? We're not talking about go get those guys over there because they're better than everybody, smarter than everybody. No, it, they're spiritual to help these people who are caught up in something that ain't right. But take heed before you go help them. Pay attention because you, you can fall in it too. So there is a different, listen, in, in, in the church, this, this show you how far the church is off track. The church, you're not even supposed to be, uh, you're not supposed to be a deacon in the church unless you're full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And we got deacons in not Crossway Church, but in the church who run the church. The preacher don't even lead the church. The deacons lead the church because they've changed the meaning of the Bible. So how did we get off in that? Okay. What man is he that fears the Lord? We'll see right here in the Scriptures. Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them, everybody say them, that fear him, and he will show who? Them, his covenant, the cross. Who is it that the Lord is showing his covenant? Those that fear him. Who are those that fear him? Those who know that God has a secret. And as I said Sunday morning, God's not hiding things from his children. He's got them hidden for you. He doesn't hide things from us. It, things of God are only hidden from a rebellious people. A humble accepting of the Messiah, God gives us the kingdom. You understand that? He gives us the kingdom. The kingdom is yours. So let's read it again. What man is he that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. Well, who's going to inherit the earth? Christians. Nobody else. All these folks that think they're running the earth today, big and mighty, big, big billionaires and all men and all this stuff. They're, they're, listen, they won't be anywhere around unless they're Christians when it comes time for the new earth to be here. They're not worthy of the new earth. They're, the Bible says they're not worthy of this earth. So, the, I love verse 14. It should be highlighted bright orange or yellow in your Bible. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And he will show them his covenant. Well, the covenant, Jesus Christ said at the, at the Last Supper, take drink. This is the blood in my new covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. You can't say new covenant without thinking about Calvary. Again, if you do, you're lost or if you're saved, you're out of the faith. Because the new covenant is all wrapped up in the blood of Jesus. The cross. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And that don't mean run around hiding from God like Adam did. It means those who have a, as you'll look up and find the first definition, you'll always see of fear, fear of the Lord, is a reverential fear. Wherever you study, and, and it, it, that's through that, is how the Lord gave us that definition that we have. He gave it to us. Because when you break the word reverential down, inside that word is the word revere. And that's a value you place on something. If CJ come in here tonight with a 10-foot rattlesnake uh, in that door, we'd, make, we'd, we'd bust that door down and be gone because we placed a value on him, number one, <laughs> and then that snake. And then we probably placed a wrong value on everybody else as we were stepping on their heads and everything trying to get out that door. But when you revere something, you just place a... A, val a worth on it. That's, that's fear in God. Your, 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 your value of God. 
and people who value God properly, which again can only be done as he's revealed himself through his son and the sacrifice. You have to add the sacrifice. You can't just talk about Jesus, miracle worker, and Jesus. Listen, it was not an act before the cross that saved anybody or even identified us with him. He was, he was identified with us, but it only took it Calvary. It, uh, that's where we were, that's where God saw the union between what he did for sinners and us being sinners and the price being paid. That's where God took us. God, listen, God didn't take us because he saw our faith some three, four thousand million years down the road and place us in his miracle work in life. He placed us in the death of Jesus, Romans 6, 3. Amen. The secret of the Lord is with them. And I have the word them highlighted in bold red because, and I'm not preaching that anybody's better than anybody, but there are more, there are some people that are more equipped than others. There are some people who are in the truth, some are not in the truth. There are some who are taken by uh, situations, sinful situations. There are some that are spiritual. It doesn't say they're perfect, but it does say they're spiritual. You can go and help somebody if you're not taken in what they're taken in. Amen. People, we're different, and we're all walking in different places of maturity. Amen. I know we all like to think we're farther along than we actually are, and then the Lord shows up and shows you just how far you ain't. <laughs> he does it, though, to help you, not to be mean. The Lord shows you how far you're not is so you'll cling to him more tight. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Let me tell you something, folks, when you, and, you've, and this, this may be one of the scriptures the Lord can minister to you and reveal an answer to you to that question, that all-time favorite question, how did, how did I get selected? How, why did God show me his covenant? Why did God show Paul the cross? Why did God just find me where he found me and begin to show me the covenant? Let's read this one more time. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. You remember my testimony up there in that old warehouse, that old oil warehouse? You've heard me say it many times. I was to the point, I, I did, listen, I was under such attack that I, I, I didn't even know if I believed in anything, anything other than God loved me. I doubted tongues. I don't know if Jeanette will remember this, but we used to have church in our house on Wednesdays. Y'all were a part of that, right? And then we met at the Horn Enterprise on Sundays. But did you ever come to our house when we had church in our house? We were, we, Dickie did, we were a hurt people. We'd been in a church and that baby split and we were part of the group that left. Thank God. And... And I say that because what Lord knows what would happen if the other people would have left and we'd still been there thinking everything was okay. But we were in our house one night and we were a bunch of hurt, broken down people that, and I mean, spiritually, when you get broke down spiritually, you, I mean, you can be hurt so bad you'll begin to doubt things you once walked in. I'm speaking from experience. And there was a man that showed up in our house that Wednesday night. Nobody even knew him. That's one bad thing about having church in your house, especially if you don't know the truth. But this guy comes in, and he sits back there and don't say anything. And then at the very end of everything, uh, after the prayer, I think even, he says, uh, some, he says something about speaking in tongues, something that just made everybody in the whole house wonder if it was even true anymore, but just by the way, he, what he said and how he said it. And, and everybody, I don't know if you remember that, everybody just filed out of the house that night like it had been a solemn assembly. But we were hurt. We were broken. We wanted to serve God. We, we wanted the church thing to work. And there we were in our house after being in ministry, in pulpits. And there we were in our house. Nothing wrong with being in the house. I'm talking about from where we were to where we went, which turned out to be a good thing. 
But you can be so hurt and so broken. And let me remind us tonight that that's the only place that God reveals his covenant. When he found you, you were broken. I'm not even talking about being lost. I'm talking about when you were saved and just going through religious stuff and trying to believe stuff they were teaching, but it wasn't working. And you, you really wondered, I'm, I'm teaching it and I'm having it taught to me and I'm teaching it, but it really ain't working. Broken, miserable. And I'm standing there with my Bible on those uh, hydraulic oil buckets and, and, I'm, and I remember telling the Lord, Lord, I don't know any. And what I meant, I doubt everything, God. I don't know anything anymore except that you love me. That's all I know. In other, I was telling God, I'm not, I'm not focusing on nothing. I don't even know if I believe any of that other stuff anymore. I'm talking about tongues and all that spirit-filled stuff. I mean, because we, that, we had been in a spirit-filled church and all that just collapsed. And you know what we think sometimes? If, if that collapses, then everything collapses. And I was hurt, broken, miserable, doubting myself, doubting God. And, and, and God found me in that broken place. And somebody turned the radio on. But God knew this, that I loved him. He knew that, that the only thing I had to cling to was his love for me and that he proved it by what he did at Calvary. The Spirit-filled life, the tongues, the interpretation, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, those are wonderful things, and we need to see them operating more than we do. But I'm telling you, when you get broke down, all that matters is God loves me and proved it at Calvary. And through that, God began to show me because that is the proper value. Whether you know anything else, you can know God loves you. He's not stopped loving you when you do something dumb. He doesn't back up a little bit. No siree. He moves in closer. He loves you when you're having a good day. He loves you on your worst day. That does not change. Maybe this scripture here will help you even later. When you ask God, what would you show me your covenant for? What, how come you not showed the rest of my family? How come my co-workers aren't seeing it? I'm telling it to them. They got a wrong value on God. According to this scripture, they got a wrong value on God. A wrong value. If you got the right value in God, that means you're clinging to his love and what he did to prove it to you. See, that's where most of the church will not go back to. They want to go back to their first denominational uh, 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 whatever. But you've got to go all the way back to your first love. I ain't going back to no man's beginning of anything. Thank God we got a crossway church and every year we might have a luncheon to celebrate one more year. But I'm telling you what, what we got today is greater than what we had 14 years ago. We're not moving back. We're not going back. I ain't never telling God, oh, oh, at least take me back to where we were because he won't do it. He's going forward. Hallelujah. Let's move on here before y'all get me held up too long. Psalms 31, 19 and 20, God's goodness experienced as we trust in him before the sons of men. Now, this is a real powerful scripture. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you've laid up for them that fear thee, which you have wrought for them that trust in you before the sons of men. I'm going to tell you something, Christians. This is no time to let the world intimidate you. This is no time to let the world intimidate you. The people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people that you're related to, listen, you are the ones who hold the power of God because you have the true faith. You're walking in the truth. You've got the name of Jesus. Christians can fall into a place of being ashamed if sin is in their life. Now hear me. Here's co here comes the tricky part. 
I ain't who I used to be. I ain't got that sin in my life. Let me say it. When, when our faith is not in the cross, that's a sin. And when I'm, sin, and when I'm in sin, shame can come. The power of the cross is the only thing that will remove my shame for sin. We got to quit thinking about sin just as lying and, and gambling and, and cheating and adult. It's just an, sin is anything I know to do right and I don't do it. Sin, when I don't have my faith in the cross, that means God can't work in my life. And if God can't work in my life, there's got to be something going on there keeping him from it. To not have your faith in the cross and the cross alone means you're living in sin. That's the deceptive thing. Well, I'm not in bars anymore. Well, good for you. Are you in the faith? Well, I'm in church down there on 4th and Broadway. No, are you in the faith? We need to start asking folk that. Are you in the faith? I believe I'm going to do that next time I start talking to somebody about the Lord and they say, well, yeah, I'll, ever since you know, I've been baptized, you know, I, I go down here. No, are you in the faith, sir? Now, I'm going to tell you something about people who are Christians. Or, I don't know if they are, but even people who've been saved, you make them mad if you just ask one or two questions. Ask the kills. You can make a Christian these days madder than fire. And the reason they get mad and uptight is because they don't have an answer because they're not concerned about an answer. And when they're pushed up against the wall, listen, they get embarrassed and that shame begins to come out. I'm shamed because I ought to know more than this. I know I should be in the Word. If you know you should, then get in it. Well, I know I should be in church. I know I should be tithing. I know I should be in the Word. No, you don't. The word no is a, a relationship thing. I know I should be in the Word puts me in the Word. I know I should be in church. Adam knew his wife. She conceived. This is eternal life that they know the one true God and his son whom he sent. Knowing something is an involvement in something. Listening to somebody tell me and me saying I know I need to be, that's just words to speed up this conversation because I got to get out of here because I'm really shamed. We ought not to be ashamed. And anybody whose faith is in the cross won't be ashamed. Let me tell you something about faith in the cross. That means faith in the blood. That means faith in the death of Jesus. And boldness comes through that alone. Christians are so deceived and so far away from God, they think boldness is when somebody does make them mad and they'll finally tell, well, I am saved. They call that bold. No, boldness hasn't got anything to do with an attitude. Boldness is just telling somebody the truth. <laughs> oh, how great is your goodness which you've laid up for them that fear thee. For them that fear thee. It's for them that fear God which you have wrought for them that trust in you before the sons of men. You shall hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Think about that. We've said for you, well, I'm just around prideful people all day long. Yeah, but you're hidden from them. You're not really hidden from them. You're hidden from the pride that's got them captured. It hadn't got you captured, remember? Pride is evil. And as long as you're abiding satisfied through your fear in the Lord that tends to lie, which means faith in the cross, listen, pride is evil. And the pride of people on your job surrounding you, it can't govern you even though it's governed them. It can't empty you of what you have if your fear stays in the Lord. You won't be emptied of your boldness. You won't be emptied of your power and strength and joy. But you will be if you move back from the cross because it carries with it an offense. And you have to make a decision. Paul did, and that decision he made is the decision we all have to make if we're going anywhere with God. We've got to become determined not just to know nothing but Christ and him crucified, but along with that determined, I don't care how offensive it is, I'm still going this way.
Because the message of the cross is not something that just makes me right and them wrong. The message of the cross is where it puts me in the fear of the Lord. That's what tends to life. That's what allows the Holy Spirit to tend to life in me. That's what allows the Holy Spirit to give me the boldness and the strength, the comfort, the confidence. You shall hide them, verse 20, in the secret of your presence from the pride of man. Oh, it's all around us, but we're hidden from the pride of man. You know, when I used to work out there where I worked, they'd, boy, they'd just, be, they'd just come up and be telling dirty jokes, and I'd just stand there and look at them. I mean, they just come up and talk ugly, and I'd just stand there and look at them. They'd think I was retarded. I wouldn't smile. I wouldn't frown. I'd just look like I was retarded. And then they'd say, oh, oh. And they'd come back later and say, well, you didn't tell me you was a preacher. I said, <laughs> One guy come up one day and said, man, I, I'm sorry I was talking like that. I, I, if I'd known you was here, I wouldn't have been saying all that. I said, well, the Lord was here before I got here. <laughs> you can make folk mad by ne- being nice to them. You shall hide them in the secret of your presence from the pride of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Don't mean That verse does not mean you're not going to be surrounded and have to work with and sometimes, Lord, help us, God forbid, but be folk in the church with a strifeful tongue. Doesn't mean you're not going to have people around you like that, but the Bible says he's going to keep you secretly in a place he calls a pavilion. I didn't look that up. I bet it'd be even better if I would have. From the strife of tongues. He's keeping you from having a strifeful tongue, even though you're surrounded by it. You can live a victorious Christian life, even if nobody else is. On your job in the classroom, wherever you go, the fear of the Lord because he delivers, he he restores. I need to be restored every day. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of his righteousness. You understand that tonight? The Lord delivers. I don't care if it's from cigarettes, if it's from drugs, if it's from whatever it is. Listen, he delivers from devils. He delivers from all sin, all manner of sin. He died and took care of all sin. The worst, vilest sin that is out there. Somebody molesting babies, somebody raping and killing, and and, and the worst thing you could imagine, somebody, the the, the law passed to kill babies. You mark my words, somebody is going to get saved. And it's, man, there are some people in prison right now who have done some horrible things that our minds can't even comprehend, but they're on their way to heaven. God had to get them locked up and get them still and broken down that way and give them an expositor study Bible or some preacher coming by telling them the blood of Jesus. And we're not going to be shocked when we get to heaven. I hear that all the time. You'll be shocked when you see him there. I'm not going to be shocked because it's all by the blood of Jesus. There's going to be people there that lived far more holier lives than me. And there's going to be people there who were, whoa, man, they were pitiful. But they're going to be there because the blood of Jesus. But there's no need in you and me living with something in our lives. When we know the Lord delivers. He does deliver. I don't care if you've not seen it up to this point. You better wake up in the morning saying, Thank you, Lord. This is the day of my salvation. Hallelujah. I'm already going to heaven, but I got some more stuff I need shucked off of me. My wife got something shucked off of her. My husband, my kids, they need deliverance, Lord. And I'm asking you on their behalf. I'm asking for them, Lord. I'm not just asking for me, not even just for us here but for those who are out there who are bound, who need deliverance, God, I'm asking you for them. God's going to begin to deliver from cancer and diabetes and all manners of infirmity because he's going to show the power of this gospel that we preach, this gospel that those preach who have the fear of the Lord. He is going it. It ain't going to make your name great. It's going to magnify the name of Jesus that the heavenly Father's glorified. 
He's going to do it before he comes. He's going to do it before he comes. If he did it in the early church and he changed water into wine to prove he saves the best for last, you better get ready. Don't let anything strip you of what you have in him where you end up one day sitting at home watching things on TV, listening to what's written in the paper when you could be right out there in the action. Hallelujah. I don't want to watch people run by me on a race. I want to jump in and run with them. I want to jump in this race and run till the finish line's there. Hallelujah. Stand with me tonight.